Listen to us anytime at your convenience, for free, no commercial interruptions. And when you want to hear more, please take a look at our members section. Philip Coppens is an author and investigative journalist, ranging from the world of politics to ancient history and mystery. Since 95, he has lectured extensively and has appeared in a number of television and DVD documentaries, including the series Ancient Aliens on the History Channel. Today we talk about his latest book, The Ancient Alien Question. Philip shares his opinion on the current mass consciousness, the scientific community, and what mankind needs to be reinvigorated. We discuss visitations from extraterrestrial beings in the archaeological, historical, and mythological record, and the proof they might have left behind. It's good to talk to you again, Philip Coppens. Welcome back to Red Eyes Radio. We had you last with us back in 2007 talking about the Canopus revelation and the Stargate mystery. So it's a pleasure to have you back again, Philip. Uh, Thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me back. Absolutely. Uh, We have a lot to discuss here today. Uh, Ancient aliens, that is our theme for uh, this program here today. And uh, this is obviously becoming a a really popular subject right now. It has entered into the mainstream, I think, quite successfully. And I think we can't begin to talk about the subject without bringing up Eric von Daniken first, obviously, with his chariots of the gods. Uh, He has to be the man, uh, Philip, who are responsible for at least, if nothing else, reigniting the subject of ancient aliens, or maybe we should call them ancient astronauts that he had uh, he did in his book, uh, Philip. Absolutely. I mean, he was the one who almost 45 years ago really popularized the subject. The question whether or not we had been alone uh, is obviously older than him. It was posed in the 1930s, even before, to some extent, even the likes of Jules Verne were posing it, I I guess. But really, he popularized it with Chariots of the Gods in 1968-69, depending on uh, which, you know, country it it was um, published in. But he, he really made people question it. And he he really brought it into, as you say, the mainstream. In the 1970s, there were major TV documentaries, both on English, American, German, and, and no doubt other countries' television networks as well. And then it disappeared for a while. He became the subject of an active, I wouldn't say disinformation or smear campaign, but definitely uh, there was a reaction in the early 1970s to everything which was questioning the authorities too much. Um, you know, 1968 is very much for, for people who were alive, a controversial time. And in the 1970s, there was a backlash. And, and Eric was a, a victim of, of that backlash because what he was asking questions about was really deemed to be something which was off limits. And so he disappeared for a while. And then actually the way Ancient Aliens came about was that the popular format, even though we think that in the 1990s and the, the 2000s, the new age, um, interest is, is on the rise again. It, it still was very niche. I think only really Graham Hancock with uh, Fingerprints of the Gods was able to to make it into something bigger um, than, than what it really was. Mm-hmm. And the, the, the main method of, of how the media dealt with this was that if there was a movie, whether it was The Matrix, whether it was an Indiana Jones movie or anything of those types of movies, uh, then there would be a special, a two-hour special. You know, The Da Vinci Code is probably another good example of how there were almost endless one or two-hour specials as a result of The Da Vinci Code, either the book or the movie, the same with Angels and Demons. Um, and it was at the end of Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skulls that... Um, the producer of Prometheus Pictures, who had done a two-hour special for, I think, NBC, contacted Giorgio Tsoukalos and really asked him, have you ever heard of this guy, Eric von Daniken? Is he still alive? And Giorgio said, you've got to be kidding, right? He's like my spiritual father. And so what happened was that a two-hour special was produced for the History Channel called Ancient Aliens. And very much it was Prometheus having to convince the History Channel that it would be good to revisit the subject 
40 years, so to speak, after Chariots of the Gods. And contrary to the History Channel's expectations, Ancient Aliens, the two-hour special, became the most watched and the highly rate, most highly rated show on the History Channel. As a result, there has been season one, season two, season three, and... Um, potentially airing as soon as February next year in America, season four. Uh, almost, you know, 40, 50 hours of television are going to be produced as a as a result of this, all of them prime time. And it's very hard these days to really get viewing figures for these shows because even if you record something, uh, it doesn't really show up in the viewing figures anymore. Mm -hmm. But it is estimated. I mean, the viewing figures are, are respectable, um, but it is estimated that at the end of an episode, when it has been repeated numerous times in America, when it has aired in, in various countries on the History Channel, a 100 million people have seen an episode um, of, of Ancient Aliens. So that is, is, is showing you the popularity. The History Channel as a result, uh, not necessarily obviously just due to Ancient Aliens, but the, the rise of the History Channel to become one of the top five cable shows uh, networks in America uh, coincides with the rise. Of, of ancient aliens and uh, the likes of Giorgio and I, we do get recognized on the street uh, in America, not anywhere else really. But um, it is showing that this has become mainstream. And what I like about it is the people's reaction. You know, this is something which the people want. They like the format of the show and they're questioning it. And and the, the, the joke I have is that I'm afraid to go to my mother-in-law and it's not for all the, the normal reasons, but it is to do with the fact that she takes notes. She takes notes about the show and at the end of the show she will ask, you know, like, what about this? What about that? Have you gone there? Um, wh what's this about? Where can I read up more about this and it's it has this mass appeal from the age of five to the age of you know 95 mm. um, and it's it's really touching as as the producers like to call something in the zeitgeist so yes it's it's out there and I think what you know the, the big good to get the big bonuses is, is the fact that this is saying um, you know people are questioning people are asking questions yeah. people are hungry for knowledge that's right. Uh, I wanted to ask you about what you believe has has changed then in the in the mass consciousness, if anything, because uh, obviously, as as the von Daniken's book indicated back in the uh, you know early seventies, then this is a subject that there was of interest then, but it was fairly soon shot down, as you said, by by mainstream um, you know mass media basically, and and the expert scientists that uh, you know come in and, and try to set people straight about the subject basically. Although we can see that still today. There's still an element of of this being, uh, you know, promoted in in a different kind of way today, and it, it's being received, I think, in a different kind of way today as well. What do you think has changed? Are we ready for this subject now? Do you think? I think what's happened is 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 on has, has you know, our changes on several levels. I think at the core. It's that we're beginning to see through the respect which people formerly had blindly in science. Go back to the days before the Watergate scandals, specifically in America, and everybody had this deep respect for politicians. Now, show me one politician who isn't hated for some reason. Um, so there's a tremendous change over the last 40 years on politics. Banks, people who had respect, you know, like it used to be the, the, the a bank manager used to be something which had respect. Now they are, you know, worse than Satan. And the same thing is happening with science. Scientists used to command this position whereby they, they, they by default were respected for their opinion. And that is changing as well. People are beginning to see that they are, you know, quite often arrogant and definitely isolated in ivory towers. And this is the same problem with whether it's with politicians, with finance people or with, um, you know, anybody else who's in a ivory tower where you can't go into and whereby these people do not speak to the to the people, really. Um, a, a very interesting reaction was in February of this year, which made it into the book, when a um, archaeology student went into the university and asked his professor about ancient aliens. And the professor just said, oh, we know that this isn't true. We know that this didn't happen. And the student had the uh, audacity to, to repeat the question, to which the professor just shouted louder, we just know, okay? <laughs> um, it, it's not a very scientific attitude and people are no longer taking it. And what I also think um, is great um, about ancient aliens versus some of the other shows 
um, is is the format. It's it's searching. It's saying, so here's a bit of evidence. Could this be? Um, and it's it leaves people in their respect. An awful lot of other shows are talking down to people. They are saying, well, you know, you should believe this. This is really what happened. Um, Ancient Aliens doesn't theorize it. Uh, when you look at a person like Eric, he asks primarily questions. They say Eric von Danik and, and his theories. Well, he doesn't really have theories. Zachariah Sitchin has theories. Um, various other you know, people who write books have theories. Eric basically questions. Eric is all about putting the question marks out there uh, and you know, suggesting that an analysis of evidence has, uh, you know, whether that is an extraterrestrial component or not. But Eric isn't going into theories as to where they might come from, uh, who was in charge of the expedition, when did they precisely land. Uh, those kind of details, I think, I, I mean, in, in my book, I definitely say that we are not ready to, to go there. Uh, and you know, to a large extent, it is because science isn't willing to engage in this subject. But, um, you know, it, it's not a theory. And I think this is the strength of the show. It's, it's continuously asking questions and um, looking at, at, at things quite often in, in very interesting ways. I mean, some of the episodes in season three tackle subjects which very few uh, ancient alien theorists, as they are designated on the show, right. um, have, have really tackled. But things like the undead as, you know, Halloween um, as it was, uh, does bring back these things about the fact that these ancient Egyptians had extraordinary opinions and um, beliefs and, to some extent, technology into preserving the dead in a certain way and 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 the question is why did they do that well you know where is this coming from and it's that kind of thing which science isn't exploring and and so it by by showing people these aspects people learn and people um you know realize that reality is far bigger than the tiny box which standard science is telling them it is that's absolutely right, and I, I think you're right on there in one sense that we've been, uh, on a mass scale, I, I think humanity has been disillusioned in a way, and uh, you know we're, we're potentially looking for something else as well, which I think is an interesting component to keep in mind when we talk about the subjects of ET, aliens, UFOs, and what have you, because I think that people, and rightly so, have you know begun to look elsewhere than to politics, as you said, or the church and religions, or, and even science, actually. So what, what part of that you know, is... is is that incorporated into this, these ideas, do you think, that people are looking for uh, other answers? You know, there must be something out there, right? Yes, and I mean, you know, the science is also very arrogant. Um, you know, so, so first of all, they say that there is nothing to this. Well, guess what? People see that there is something to this. You, you know, for one, you cannot present 40 hours of television without there being some substance to this. Even the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills is based on, you know, whatever amount, four, five, or I actually don't watch the show, but that there are, you know, like there are a number of housewives there who live in Beverly Hills. It's not completely fabricated. Um, and the, the same thing is with ancient aliens. You know, there is a body there um, which clearly is, you know, um, almost like a volcanic eruption rising to the surface and telling people, you know, okay, this is the kind of evidence which doesn't want to go away. And the reason why that certain bit of evidence doesn't want to go away is, first of all, because part of it is convincing and or um, the fact that science is not willing to address it because they know it, it cannot be so. And I think people are beginning to f being fed up with this arrogance of science. And it's not just uh, on, on ancient aliens. I also think it's on the ET question. Mm. Uh, fortunately, NASA is, is f you know, w with SETI, it was looking for a needle in a haystack. And uh, NASA has now embraced astrobiology. And you can just see that there's a new wind flowing through the entire uh, department and the entire science. And it's, it's almost going too fast, so to speak, in the sense that even newspapers can't keep up with what NASA is discovering on an almost daily basis. <laughs> but that, that is fresh, that is scientific. Um, 
but when you look at science again as a whole, they will tell you that they're not interested in certain stuff like near-death experiences or reincarnation. Um, and in those cases, um, they're, they're not as arrogant as to say, I mean, some of them are, but as a, as a general rule, they're not as arrogant as to say that there's nothing to it. They are just saying that this thing of near-death experiences touches more the fields of religion uh, and that, that therefore it is not really the bailiwick of science. Well, guess what? You know, you, you made that line, you drew that line in the sand yourself. There is a public out there who I think would be quite interested to find out what happens before and after death. Uh, well, before birth and after death. And, um, you know, that is something whereby science is just, just like, no, nah, we're not going to study that. And I think that is an attitude which they cannot maintain. Yeah. And I think the shift is, is becoming apparent. Um, What's happening, I think, you know, climate, the, the climate scientists are the, the, unfortunately or fortunately the first people to be exposed to this. It's a controversial science. Um, and to some extent at this moment in time, the powers that are, are able to say, well, there's bad scientists and good scientists. And the bad scientists are all in the employ of bad people who don't want uh, this thing about global warming to be real. And then the good scientist is everybody else. And that is simply not the case. Uh, you know, the, 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 the debate is flawed on both sides and the, the, the scientific excesses are pretty much on par with everything else in science. But it is becoming apparent that there are certain things wrong with science uh, and that even the good scientists as climate gate made clear uh, two years ago if i'm not mistaken is that they f create fake material yeah, um yeah. and in june of 2001 archaeology magazine ran a uh, an editorial which basically said that so much of the peer-reviewed documents were, were were faked that they had basically taken material out of cupboards somewhere of a museum uh, and and injected them into to new conclusions uh, pretending that these had been newly discovered artifacts whereas they've been sitting in museums for you know, decades if not hundreds of years <laughs> and that is something which is going to become more and more exposed over the next five to ten years and I think there's a, a, actually a danger there as much as you know I, I am a skeptic about the scientific establishment and their ivory towers uh, I have absolutely great respect for scientists like the astrobiologists of NASA and so many others who are pushing the frontiers of our understanding on a daily basis but if people become disillusioned with science as a whole they're going to believe anything else uh, and they will go for extraordinary theories and this is something which you're seeing in, in politics you know the reason why conspiracy theories are so out there uh, and are so much believed is not because of the existence of the internet it is because people know that politicians are lying to them and there is nobody to really go in there and and find out what is the truth you know, to 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 what extent are we being manipulated and so because there's nobody doing that um people go to the other extreme which is the conspiracy theories which tell people that they can explain everything uh, that they don't have to live in uncertainty or don't have to find out certain things for themselves and you know in the case of politics it's obviously the role of the media to to be there uh, and in the case of science uh, in the next five to ten years I think a, a reinvigorated media specifically investigative journalism um, will will or should or hopefully will play a role in that uh, and, and that the, this border of, of science and exploration really begins there. Because I think, I mean, the final aspect to this is that I also think one of the, the things is here that as a society we have lost great ambition. Uh, the Cold War and surviving the space race uh, is, you know, not the most noble of things of, of exploration, but at least it was, a, a, you know, a, a big task for mankind to do so going to the moon going to mars to some extent were big challenges and these days there are no such big uh challenges anymore and i think uh you know finding evidence uh, finding proof of the existence of et finding out evidence of um the fact 
whether or not we have been visited in the past by extraterrestrial beings is something which is really going to potentially reinvigorate um, mankind as a whole and really allow us to dream and create. Uh, when I say dream, it's not imagine or hallucinate, but really come up with big plans as to you know maybe go out into the big wide universe and make contact with them. Absolutely. The, the title, by the way, of your book, the full title is The Ancient Alien Question, new, uh, A New Inquiry into the Existence, Evidence and Influence of Ancient Visitors. And maybe we can just backtrack a little bit here then and, and kind of go through the concept uh, or the theory, if you want to call it that, uh, and basically, uh, you know, paint the outline of, of what the ancient alien question actually uh, is. And we can run through some of the uh, maybe some of the evidence as well. And obviously some of the, the things that you do touch upon in, in the book, Philip. Absolutely. Well, basically, you know, the book was a companion volume to the series. Um, I felt that we had to go deeper into some of the evidences, some of the theories connected with ancient aliens. And I really look at the archaeological evidence. I also look at the mythological evidence. I look at some of the big theories out there, the Sitchins, the William Bramleys, to some extent, the David Icke's. Um, and, and, tell you that there are people there who claim to have the ultimate answer to the ancient alien question. And in short, they don't. Um, in the case of Sitchin, there is clear evidence that he was mistaken. Uh, there's even some evidence to suggest that he definitely was uh, on an ego trip um, to, to prove that he was right, whereas the evidence really doesn't suggest as much. In the case of William Bramley, um, uh, he's a very interesting person. He sees that w wars are quite often manipulated by a so-called third hand, a hidden hand, which isn't really identified by historians. Now, that is true. Where he jumps to the conclusion, which is unsupported at this moment in time, is that he, he, he says that this hidden hand is always the same. In short, the hidden hand behind World War I would be the same as the hidden hand between uh, the Cathar Crusade, so to speak, or uh, a war between Egypt and you know, 2000 BC. And that is simply not the case. You know, you, you, for them to... So the conspiracy theories... Um, basically say, well, there's this hidden hand uh, and they have survived the secret society, the Illuminati or whatever, um, and, and they have been in power for that long. And it's just something which at this moment in time is unsupported by the evidence. And to then jump to the next level, which is that somehow the Illuminati, RET, is even a step too far beyond already a step which is way too far on its own. So where this leaves us is the historical evidence and the archaeological evidence. And the archaeological evidence is interesting, but to some extent, uh, as the book makes clear, cannot provide a rounded up answer because stones at the end of the day are mute. You can show that the Great Pyramid incorporates advanced mathematics, which definitely historians are unwilling a credit to the ancient Egyptians. You can show that these stone blocks, the casing blocks of the Great Pyramid, were used with a chemical process called geopolymerization, which was only rediscovered in the 1970s. But without the historical context, you cannot make that link to um, whether or not there is ET guidance there. And that is really what I'm doing in the book. To some extent, it's it's obvious when you read the book um, the first time around, but if people are going to read it the second time around, I think the, the hidden layer is there that I really weave those two uh, in together. And this is where it becomes interesting because the person who discovered the science of geopolymerization in ancient Egypt was a guy called Imhotep, not the guy from the mummy movies, but the guy uh, who was the high priest of Heliopolis under Zoser. And he's the person credited with the creation of the science. Now, the question then is, was this guy simply a genius or was he helped? And this is where the historical evidence comes backs up, you know, like the archaeological question mark, mm -hmm. which is he's basically saying, I got help from the gods. When we go to Pumapunku, to Bolivia, we are confronted with an archaeological site which is extraordinarily interesting, yeah. whereby some of these things, um, you know, clearly, either we are once again confronted with a mad genius or there was a 
practical purpose to this, which defies anything we know about that, that civilization. Now, where is Pumapunku? It is at the Bolivian Altiplano, and it is there that all the Inca legends say that their civilizing deity, Viracocha, came out of the water, uh, some people say out of, a, of an opening, a, a kind of stargate, um, and that he walked through the sacred valley on his way to the um, Pacific Ocean, and that alongside this walk, he civilized the Inca civilization. Now, the Inca civilization is bigger than the sacred valley. The sacred valley basically is Cusco, uh, Olantay, Tambo, to some extent Machu Picchu. Now, there are things like pyramids near Corral. There is obviously the Nazca Lines in Peru. But the interesting thing is this. All the strange blocks of engineering, all the things which science, um, if it were to address it, has a very hard time of explaining, all of the things which are discussed in ancient aliens, all of these things come from that sacred valley. And it is that overlap between archaeology and history, to some extent mythology as mm -hmm. well, yeah. that really makes the connection of saying, okay, this is stuff where we really need to seriously question um, where this knowledge came from. And it is then really up to us to decide whether we are willing to accept our ancestors on their word or whether we're going to have an argument with them. But if we take them on their word, then, you know, the answer of the ancient alien question can only be one thing, which is that our ancestors were absolutely convinced that th we did not walk the past of civilization alone. We were guided by, I would say, benev benevolent, um, non-human intelligences, which sometimes um, are reported as having been here in a physical format and sometimes in a non-physical format, but pretty much that we were not alone. And that is really the key message, I think, of the ancient alien question, that uh, there is a substantial body of evidence out there which we seriously need, need to look at and at the end of the day, um, you know, almost present it on a plate to science and say, okay, science, if you are willing to engage and really tackle and look at these questions, um, at that moment in time, we might begin to get some real answers. And, you know, the title of the book might then be called at some point, The Ancient Alien Answer, rather than The Ancient Alien Question. <laughs> right. And the question here is if we need to, I don't know, reevaluate what the, what the aliens were or, or are, if their presence actually still is, is here on Earth in that sense. But um, just because it's in the mythological record, if you will, then, or the, the, the scripture, the, the, the style, stylized versions on, on some of the stones, which, which tell a story about how knowledge have been received from gods and so forth, uh, we could still, Philip, be talking about a spiritual force and, and, and influence from, a, if you will, than a divine realm. It doesn't necessarily have to mean that we're talking about a physical flesh and blood or whatever they have, E.T., right? Absolutely. And this is something which I, you know, highlight in, in the book. Um, the book is just out, but one of the early, um, you know, uh, reviews of it is that indeed it widens this concept of of ancient alien contact on a very limited level um, the statistical analysis of us having been contacted by ET in the past in mankind's human habitation on this planet uh, is between two and four so if we were and, you know, the book presents some like 15 to 20 best evidence case scenarios of, of potentially having been uh, contacts of, of uh, an ET uh, civilization with our ancestors. So on what we now know, you would expect that out of those 15 to 20 cases, 10 to 15 are going to have an answer no. And for that, really, you know, we need to do more research and to some extent, again, science needs to be willing to engage on these things. Um, only two to four um, should survive. If there are five or six, that's beating the odds of, of having this, this kind of contact. And an awful lot of, and, and you know, they fall into two categories. One of them might be accidental spacecrafts. Uh, I mean, I don't know whether we're going to have time, but the, the Chinese Roswell scenario is, is one of those scenarios whereby it seems that thousands of years ago, E.T. crash landed somewhere in the remote parts of, of Tibet mm -hmm. and, and really, you know, were stranded. And what were they going to do? Uh, another scenario, of course, is this kind of colonization um, uh, effect whereby, um, you know, th there's this, this global civilization of, of ETs who, who seem to have done certain things. That is f far more 
uh, part and parcel of the what I would call the big ancient alien theories rather than what the evidence is suggesting. Uh, most of the evidence is suggesting that there is almost one-on-one -on -one contact this kind of OET makes contact and then gives us information to to help us to advance. But this is uh, in in the book. I I quite often go back to Contact, the movie uh, based on the novel by Carl Sagan, because Carl was really a pioneer of this. And I think late in life he became skeptical about specifically the way UFO research was done and he was extraordinarily skeptical about crop circles and on both instances I agree with him but he was publicly declared I think by the alternative community as a skeptic and he really wasn't uh, he was a scientist he was an explorer and he was commenting on what he saw with you know reason and and logic but he also made it clear that he was convinced that we had been contacted in the past. And so in contact, what he really shows you is a technological device which is being uh, constructed, but the means of contact actually has to do in a non-physical manner. Ali is disappearing into nothingness. She experiences something uh, which apparently is 18 hours, but which for us observers on the Earth is not even a nanosecond, so to speak. And, and that is something what you see again in the in the the historical record, you see um, creatures like Owanis who make physical contact with our ancestors. But at the same time, it is also apparent that our ancestors were able to go literally out of their mind, not in the sense of hallucination, but really to take their head outside of their body and make contact with non-human intelligences mm -hmm. and you know i think the case um of terence mckenna is the most interesting there because in in his scenario um and to some extent also the work of michael harner you, you're beginning to see that what is the ancient alien question just didn't die um when prehistory became history but that really it is something which is ongoing people continue to report um this knowledge with ancient uh, intelligences which are non-human in nature yep that's right and and do you think that the nature of the context then have uh, changed uh, you know today versus back then i mean if if they the, the aliens then in one sense are are truly responsible for seeding our civilization maybe not hands on directly but at least influencing uh, the right people, if you will, in the right places to 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 begin the concept of civilization, uh, then then I can understand that the that the measure of contact was different back then, as is, as it would be maybe maybe today. W would you agree with that? Um, yes and no. I think that the, the manner of contacting, um, you know, has always remained the same, and I think the information given by them to us has always remained the same. Um, to some extent, the science of geopolymerization or the time wave zero, which Terence McKenna got, is the same kind of information from a non-human intelligence. So the nature of the contact hasn't changed, but I think the context in which uh, contact is made was. Today, it happens on the fridges of society. It happens in remote jungles, the Amazon. Uh, it happens, you know, with the likes of, of Eric, who is not uh, you know, a, a mainstream science. When we go back to, let's say, 2000, 3000 and older BC, what we are confronted with here is a state who actively wants contact to be established, whether it's the priestesses in Delphi, whether it is the Egyptian, um, you know, priests and priestesses in, in obviously in Egypt. Those temple complexes were there because the authorities in charge, in power, their sole status almost was in being the middle ground yep. between the people of the earth with the people um, out there. Mm. And so it was institutionalized. It was meant to be. Um, and I think this is the big difference. So imagine if we are going to do a, a big project today, um, you know, we, we're not going to go to the visionaries. We're not going to go to the to the specialist. We are going to go to construction engineers and maybe a, a beautiful architect designer uh, who who is able to build certain things with style is going to be included in it. In the past, their first point of contact would have been not a project manager but a visionary. They would go to the gods and say, "How can we do this? Why are we doing this? What is the context within which we're doing this?" And the context was often 
Fafnir to build a uh, heaven on earth, to build the constellations on this planet, to make sure that we were building in line with the, with the will of the gods and that we could really contact the gods as a result. Um, this, this alliance as above, so below was really all about that. This link between non-human intelligences and, and humans in an active participation of exploration of walking this path of civilization. And that is different hmm. from, from the times we live in today. Well, that is really interesting, though, though because that implies that you're talking about uh, geometry and ratios in terms of the buildings that are, are, are here. And, and, and it could be argued, and I've heard other researchers do so as well, uh, that there is a continuation of that line of thinking when we watch or look at certain cities, certain monuments around in, in, in the, some of the major node points in the world, Washington, D.C., Paris, London, etc., right? Absolutely. I mean, one of the things which um, my, my wife uh, Kathleen and, and I have been doing is is looking into um, appearances of the tree of life design into buildings. And we are seeing them happening everywhere, roughly in a time scale uh, of, of, say, 1600 uh, up until now. Um, it, it's probably older, but we haven't we, we haven't come across it. Um, and, and it shows you that the, the reason why this was done was because of a discipline which basically argued that if you were going to do these kind of things, um, literally the space-time continuum, to use that term, was going to be upset um, in a good way. It could be allowed to be controlled. You could establish contact again with the divine. So this this notion was clearly apparent uh, in the um, from the 16th century onwards, and the places where you see this happening, specifically uh, Versailles and Rennes Chateau, all of a sudden you're beginning to be confronted with indeed stories going back decades of people who see anomalous experiences happening there. Um, so that is just one example of of a science like that. But when you start looking back into the more distant past, you you see the same thing happening. It is clear that there was a extraordinary building design happening in so many things. You know, Schwalo de Lubitsch is probably the most uh, famous example of this, who looked at the Gothic cathedrals and then went to Egypt and fell in love with Egypt and said, oh my God, this is, you know, he considered it to be the birthplace of the science. I would say that Egypt mm. was just an older rendition uh, of, of the science and that we're probably going to find more, uh, even older applications of this. But yes, you know, there's, when it, when it talks about pi and phi, we credit the ancient Greeks with them. And now it is a fact that these ratios were used in the megalithic civilization. They were used in ancient Egypt. Um, and, you know, the divine proportion, divine ratio, there's a reason why it is called divine. It is A, because it is divine in the concept of, of linking it with the gods um, and that it is also about this perennial, this divine uh, beauty Im embedded in this. And it is precisely that kind of science which the historical documents related to, for example, Oannes is about, you know, the ancient alien aspect of it. Oannes was a creature which came out of the Persian Gulf, which was said to be half man, half fish, and it gave the Babylonians everything they needed to know about the sciences of civilization. And one of this was to do with geometry, with these weird uh, divine ratios stuff. So again, all of this is traced back to a body of knowledge, uh, you know, which in, in later periods of time would become known as the Corpus Hermeticum, the, the, the body of thought. Um, all of this is, is information which is, you know, directly coming from deities, whether they are physical, um, angelical, whatever, they are a non-human intelligence. And that's really what I want to do with the ancient alien question is break it out of the rather reduced framework of what I would say the 1960s and the early 1970s, whereby the sole emphasis was on the physical contact. Yeah. I think it is far wider than that. Uh, and again, uh, you know, I, I think we need to credit to some extent Carl Sagan with having that beautiful insight as well. Uh, I, th I think he has gone unappreciated for being a scientist who had that insight and, and visualized it in a novel. Didn't he participate in the Voyager? Was it one or two in terms of the gold disc that was sent out there and, and things like that? That this, I mean, there is a there is an engagement there. There is a recognition and nod, if you will, that there is a contact going on, right? Well, absolutely, and you know, I mean, 
we started off by saying that science is in ivory towels, uh, towers, uh, though towels maybe as well, and uh, really that they should get out of there. And this is precisely what Carl Sagan was doing um, with the entire Voyager mission. He said you should have a camera on these Voyager missions when you go um, to these foreign places, and specifically to Mars, you need to have a camera there. And the academics were saying, but a camera? We, we have no use for a camera. What's the purpose of this camera? And Sagan said, people want to see. You need to be able to break these things down so that it's accessible from a three-year-old child to, you know, a 95-year-old granny. Um, mathematical equations are great, um, but at the final analysis, they are not giving a complete picture. And this was always the case with Carl. He wanted to make science accessible. Uh, he need, he, you know, when it's, when he said that science should be popular, he didn't meant that science should be liked it meant that science always you know should be there for the people uh it should be there at a level accessible to them as well mm. and and that is something um you know which he tried to do and he also felt that that sending out these missions into deep space was was something for us to be coming you know like saying okay we are ready to do these kind of things it's it's again it's it's this this big mission statement you know which we have lost it's a big mission boldly going where no one has gone before it's it's you know that single line is one of the reasons why star trek became famous it's not to do with the bad science you know uh, cgi effects um of of the late of 1960s which are so apparent in in the original series it's to do because it made people dream and and that is really uh, what carl was about and i also think once again the popularity of ancient aliens uh, has to do with that because it makes people dream it says reality is bigger than um what we so often are told it is and it's be more beautiful than we are told it is as well that's right. Uh, and some monuments and, and, and temples and, and even unfinished uh, construction sites are, are pretty much unexplainable in terms of how they were uh, built or, or in some cases when it comes to uh, stones, how they were you know, excavated, the quarries, etc. There, there, there's so many inconsistencies or, or anomalies from our point of view. Uh, and, and, and maybe we can just touch upon some of these, obviously. But, but also, would that imply then, uh, do you think, Philip, that that this means basically that human had humans had to have help from from elsewhere or does it simply imply that we actually you were using techniques that we were that was unfamiliar to us because again you brought up the idea of geopolymers we had joseph davidovitz with us explaining this so this is no i mean it might seem like a mystery then from our point of view because we don't understand the science but but if we did it would be pretty basic right well, I mean, in the case of geopolymers, again, it's, you know, either Imhotep was a genius and he figured it out all by himself or he was guided. Um, you know, in theory, you have to apply the Occam's razor there and say, well, he probably was a genius. So there is no ET component there. However, in his own day and age, he went on the record and said, I'm... I might be a genius, but I didn't do it all by myself. Mm. And that is something which you see across uh, the board as a, not a general rule, but definitely a recurring pattern. And so when we are confronted with this thing, you know, it's like, let's go to Baalbek. In Baalbek, right. we know that at the end of the 20th century, some of these stones um, could have been lifted, but could not have been transported with the technology of the late 20th century. Yet somehow, you know, we know they were lifted because they are in situ in Baalbek in, in, in the Lebanon. So they were lifted. The same thing with Coral Castle. We do not know how Leeds Kalanen did it, but somehow he was able to do this. So the worst case scenario is that we um, rediscover a lost science of how to transport massive blocks of stone with something like levitation or acoustics or, you know, Nobody seems to know what. There's only speculation at this moment in time. Or, um, and or, um, we, we find that it was done by a, a non-human intelligence. And to some extent, it's an end universe in the sense that the non-human intelligence might have just told our ancestors, okay, so you want to have this 2000 ton stone in this building, but you have no clue as to how to do this. Okay, this is the answer. And in that case, it's, it's once again very much the scenario of um, where we are with, with geopolymerization and, and Imhotep, whereby ET isn't coming down 
the sky and kind of like saying, okay, this is a, a class and we're going to do this for you. It's no, it's giving them or it's giving our ancestors uh, the instructions on how to do this. It's very similar to what happens for Terence McKenna and Time Wave Zero. Uh, in that case, the non-human intelligences say, you think that... Um, Time is just a byproduct of the laws of physics, that it's somehow just something to do with gravity and that it's got something to do with space, but you guys are wrong. Time exists. Time is a mathematical equation and here's the equation. And by the way, when you're beginning to understand this, you're going to be in, beginning to understand why certain novelty things, why new things uh, happen uh, in, in certain places and then there are times when almost nothing new happens at all. And so they gave that to Terence McKenna and Terence you know, might not have been the best person to give this to because uh, A, it wasn't his area of expertise, um, but at least he was given this because so few people from our realm were contacting that realm. But it is out there, you know, it's for a mad genius who might be four years old at this moment in time and hears about it for the first time um, via ancient aliens or whatever um, to to look at this and say, wow, you know, time is completely different and who begins to study, study this fractal wave and comes up with an answer. Um, and that is very much... Um, you know, when I say in the book and when I draw the conclusion in the book that we did not walk the path of civilization alone, this is very much what um, seems to have happened uh, time and time again. Hmm. Um, the non-human intelligence helped us. It, you know, it, it made us continuously expand our, our horizons, which is why some of these things which were built in our past are so phenomenal. Um, on a scale that, you know, they survived the times, they survived the ages, they survived warfare, um, they, they persevered. And, and that is something I think which is, you know, also testimony to the power, um, of, of, of what this collaboration was. Um, and, and again, if the only thing which we're ever going to, to learn, um, is that in some of these instances, it was only um, our ancestors who were geniuses. That's fine. Again, statistically, out of the 20 best evidences put forward, only two to four uh, should have anything to do with non-human intelligences. That leaves 16 things, um, you know, or 15 things which are going to be uh, the bailiwick of, of completely human geniuses. No, so if this is an... Well, I don't know if we can say it's an ongoing campaign, but it was something that was started initially way back when, and, and we, maybe we, we can even talk about how far back in the record, if you will, um, mythology or history record that this actually goes. But what do you think is the, I guess, objective in one sense? Are we being groomed? Are we being educated, helped? What, what do you think? I think it is very much a... a a joint project. Uh, I think it's a joint venture. I think civilization and, and existence is, you know, when you bring it down, what human life really is, is very much something of a, whatever you want to call it, a mind, a spirit, a soul, who wants to experience living on, in this case, planet Earth, um, within a reduced kind of experience, uh, but still wants to excel still wants to create something, still wants to leave a lasting legacy. Um, and this is very much, I mean, I, I hinted at it at, at the, you know, the, the body of, 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 of Hermes, the Corpus Hermeticum. But in there, uh, it basically says that we drink from the waters of memory once before birth to forget. And then our mission in life is really to awaken and drink again from the waters of memory in life and realize why we're here for, what we're doing, what we can achieve. Um, and I think that that is, you know, that moment that is the pinnacle um, where really you say, OK, so I will connect to the world out there um, and really try to excel and really try to to create something which uh, is going to be everlasting. And to some extent, that is what civilizations like ancient Egypt were. They, they were everlasting. You know, we we are spellbound by these things. Stonehenge, Avebury, uh, a completely different civilization, but the same spell 
binding effect. Mm. The Mayan civilization, again, um, it stirs something in us. It's something which is in our soul, um, which gets awoken by by looking at these things. Um, you know, part of the reason why Ancient Aliens, again, is, is popular is because people see these things on, on TV and, and realize um, on, on a heart level um, that that these things were built for a reason far more than what science is, is telling us. You know, the Great Pyramid allegedly was built as a tomb. People just realize that is simply... There's so much more to this. Yes, even if it was built as a tomb for a person, which I don't buy, yeah. um, but even if that was the case, there is so much more to the Great Pyramid than that. Um, and reducing this monument just to, oh, it's a tomb for a pharaoh, um, is probably the greatest disservice you could do to ancient Egypt. Yet Egyptologists do it on a daily basis. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's a, it's a very good point. It's like the, they want to have recognition for the work, but then when you begin to point out the, the the true magnificence of the work it's 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 kind of put down but uh yeah that, that's an interesting point that that implies obviously that we have much more going on here that we have monuments standing uh lasting through the the ages as it were in some cases uh age wise the, the, these many of the monuments are even in dispute in terms of actually how 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 far back they go but when it comes to the et contact uh you know question basically how far back do you think it goes into, into into the record? Are we talking about the inception of the of the human race, or or, or do they come along somewhere in our journey? Do you think? Uh, I think at this moment in time, it's a very hard question to answer. Um, did ET play with human genetics? Um, I don't think so at this moment in time. I don't think there's real evidence to suggest that. Uh, did you know, like there is massive mythological evidence to suggest that non-human intelligences. Um, played with genetics on planet Earth, tried to do various bits of interbreeding. Um, but that is different from whether we were played um, with as well. You know, in the book, I make it apparent that DNA as a whole comes from outside of, 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 the, of this planet, uh, which I think is a far more likelier um, scenario. And I think, you know, the, 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 the real way to go. But I think at this moment in time, it's, it's too hard of an answer to give based with the amount of evidence we have that, um, you know, how far it goes back. If we trust Manito, then it definitely goes back to 27,000 years ago. Um, and I would say definitely contact with non-human intelligences is probably as old um, as, as mankind itself. I think um, we have, or we were originally more open to being able to access these dimensions far better, far easier, far more comp uh, competitively than um, we, we are able to do so today. So, uh, you know, does it go back to, to mankind's origin? I, I think so. Can we prove it at this moment in time? No. Uh, and to some extent, I think it's, it's not the main question uh, we, should, we should be uh, focusing on when it comes to the ancient alien debate. I think we're going to carry on here in our next segment, uh, uh, Philip, in our member section. We have much more to discuss, obviously. I want to, uh, once more, though, obviously give out the, the book title that we've been talking about here, The Ancient Alien Question, A New Inquiry into the Existence, Evidence and Influence of Ancient Visitors. And the website is philipcoppens.com. We will have that linked up on the website. And uh, I have to say as well, Philip, you have a lot of good articles on your website. It's a, a frequent uh, a hit, if you will, that, that comes up to your site when it comes to a lot of the uh, well, first of all, sites around the world, but but more than that, it, it, it extends beyond that. And, and, and there's so many other aspects that we uh, might touch upon a little bit later, too, on some of the things you have in your, in your uh, on your website, rather, Philip. But uh, is there anything else you want to mention about the book or where it's available or something like that before we run things up with the first section here? Well, the book is available everywhere. It's available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble in uh, America. Obviously, the local Amazon affiliates across the world are carrying it as well. So basically, the book is available everywhere where books are sold. Excellent. Once more, philipcoppins.com. Stay with us then, Philip. We'll carry on in the next segment after this short break. We continue with Philip Coppins in the next hour, discussing contact and the UFO field. We begin putting focus on ancient texts, the Bible, the accounts of the gods from the ancient world, and we ask if E.T. ever will return, and what Philip thinks about the official disclosure movement and much more. Don't miss this continuation with Philip Coppins. Log in or subscribe to get full access to our members area. To tune in to this or any of our previous programs, RedEyesCreations.com, that is the website. 
By the way, click into our radio archive and click on search at the top menu and search for a topic or a guest. We've done about 500 programs and there's a lot to choose from. Also, take a look at our upcoming guests as well. Some of these include Franco Collins, Peter Moon, Colin Andrews, Carl Munch, David Talbot, Joshua Hart, Tony Bushby and Peter Dale Scott, to name a few. Thank you for staying with us here on Red Ice Radio.